the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, wonder weapon or common sense, tactical briefing, winter update in detail, and metal beasts, Soviet Gen 4. We'll continue talking about the new vehicles in this episode, and today's Metal Beast is the main competitor for the F-16. Please welcome a Soviet Generation 4 multi-role fighter, the MiG-29 Modification 913. NATO reporting name is Fulcrum. Wasn't that one of those things Archimedes needed to move the world? This machine is propelled by two hungry bypass turbojet engines with afterburners. The fuel is stored in six self-sealing tanks with an option to add drop tanks. The nose of the plane hides the radar and optical systems. Its forward firing armament includes a 30mm autocannon with 150 rounds of ammo. Its six pylons can carry bombs, rockets, and guided air-to-air -air missiles. There's a well-known real-life joke about this MiG, saying that it can run out of fuel even before it takes off. It's also sometimes called a hell for leather on a tether, and a plane for achieving air superiority over its own airfield. We already know from the F-16's introduction, however, that a short flight range is a widespread flaw. Just think about it. Two engines consume more than 16 liters of kerosene each second in afterburner mode. Internal fuel tanks won't even last five minutes at such a pace. So, strange as it might seem, external fuel tanks are an inalienable part of the new MiG. An extra 1,500 liters of fuel? Yes, please. Especially since the drop tanks don't take up any hard points for suspended armament, and the MiG can boast a ludicrous level of flight performance. Speaking of the latter, this plane has set a new record in maximum speed in War Thunder. It can reach the speed of 1,570 kilometers per hour close to the ground, if it doesn't run out of fuel, of course. So that proves that the drop tanks don't add that much air drag. Now the fighter's additional equipment deserves some attention, too. It has a radar and an optical system for target search, acquisition, and tracking. While for close-range combat, the pilot has a helmet-mounted display, the very first one in War Thunder. It enables target acquisition for infrared-guided missiles without pointing the nose of the plane at them, thus providing an invaluable advantage. The MiG-29's air-to-air arsenal includes the familiar all-aspect R-60M, as well as the new medium-range R-27 missiles, with thermal vision and radar-guided homing devices. MiG-29 fans will definitely remind us of the R-73 missiles in the comments, so here's our response in advance. When this Soviet fighter sees more counterparts with equal strength, its arsenal will surely be augmented with more advanced short-range missiles. In the meantime, we had to limit its capabilities a little for the sake of keeping the balance. Now, for ground targets, this aircraft can carry bombs and rockets, but using them might be tricky at this battle rating. Top SAMs can easily punish such audacity. That's why the legendary MiG-29 should instead do what it had been created for, defend the skies from enemy aircraft. The more you have, the more you want is a good phrase to describe the entire history of German self-propelled guns. Once the army saw the success of the Stug 3, they asked for more options built on other chassis, and soon received a whole line ranging from the light Hetzer to the heavy Jagdtiger. Assault howitzers had a similar path. The Sturmpanzer showed a great performance in urban combat, but its gun felt lacking at times, and its mass stretched the capabilities of the chassis. So of course, the army wondered, why couldn't they commission a heavier assault gun? Something to push the boundaries of possibility. Right at that time, the Porsche Tiger's fate was being discussed. Its unfinished chassis was meant to be repurposed into tank destroyers with 88mm cannons, the future Ferdinands. 
There was also a cancelled option number two, an assault mortar with a caliber of 210 millimeters. We'll never know what it might have looked like. The Porsche Tiger chassis were soon gone, and the mortar never left the blueprint phase. Still, the high command kept that idea in mind. Next time, they took the Henschel Tiger chassis and a 380 millimeter rocket launcher. In October 1943, the Alquette company built their first prototype of the Panzer Sturm Moser, or simply, the Sturm Tiger. It only required minor changes. The turret was replaced with a large combat compartment that could boast very thick frontal armor, 150 millimeters, and it was sloped. It featured an original rocket exhaust venting system with a ring of shafts around the barrel. Reloading was a huge issue. It was kind of expected with the weight of the projectile reaching 350 kilograms. It required a special crane to load the ammo into the machine, while the soldiers inside had to use a special jack to lift it and put it into the barrel. Then another tool was used to rotate the round along the grooves of the barrel, allowing the breech to be shut. Done. It didn't even take 20 minutes to load the gun. Suffice it to say, this machine was very peculiar. A monstrously long reload time, tiny ammo pool, low accuracy, and the chassis didn't prove to be much more reliable than its little brothers. The only thing that had no strings attached to it was the firepower. All in all, 18 of these machines were built. Heavy tanks were in higher demand on the front lines, so the Germans probably didn't want to affect their production. That's why the Sturm Tigers were assembled from other machines undergoing major repairs. The sluggish SPGs never had a chance for mass production. Their main task was providing fire support in storming cities. However, the Sturm Tigers were first built when the Germans were already retreating, so they never saw any assaults. Well, not all projects need to be finished. Sometimes it's better to stop before it's too late. The new update brings fresh vehicles and locations, but also introduces a large number of other changes. Let's focus on them today. We'll break with tradition and start with the Navy. The reason for this is the completely new voice lines for crews. Each nation now has its own language. You can hear three different types of lines from your ship crew. The commander giving orders, and the officers and sailors providing reports about the combat situation and the condition of the vessel. Things like enemies detected, their type, direction and distance to them, reports on damage, fires and flooding, critical listing, and mechanisms no longer functioning. The results of your own shooting and many other things are now reported, and the intonation of those reports depends on the combat situation. Your vessel is now alive. There's a lot to describe in these changes, but the best way is to take to the sea and listen to it all yourself. So, how do you find it? We're not done yet. The soundscape of naval battles will become richer and more diverse with each new update. And since we're talking about the Navy, take a look at these new beauties. No less than five new types of aircraft carriers are ready to send you into the skies in any part of the ocean. Just don't forget to take a look at the detail of their decks before you take off. Regular airfields underwent some changes too. We added nighttime lights for them, helping you to find the strip and adding to the atmosphere. Especially when you dive into the simulator mode and hop onto a plane with a beautiful cockpit. And now, back to tradition. Let's talk about the new mechanics added to aircraft. So, custom loadouts were added to almost 30 planes and helicopters, including the Sky Raider, the Panther, the Crocodile, and the Thunderstreak. Engine fire prevention systems were enabled on the Eel 28, MiG-15 and 17, Shiden, Saab 21, and other aircraft. The grand total is 28. Moreover, a number of Soviet aircraft received fuel tank pressurization systems that use neutral gases to reduce the explosion chances for fuel vapors. Moreover, a large number of planes and helis received updated arsenals with new bombs, rockets, flares, and chaff. Oh, we can also show you all the aircraft with drop tanks currently available. 
five versions of the F-16, three Tornadoes, the MiG-29, the Top Vigan, and the Strike Mirage 2000. You've already seen some of them, and we'll showcase the rest in the upcoming Metal Beasts. Before we wrap up the aviation part, we'd like to talk about another plane with a helmet-mounted display like the one found on the MiG-29. We mean the old Phantom, or more precisely, its American modification, J. This change will enable it to use its somewhat flawed missiles in close-range combat. As for ground vehicles, we've reworked the hit indicators. There are now different ones available, showing non-penetrations, damaged modules, crew members knocked out, and fires. Speaking of vehicles, we'd like to highlight the American Striker. We've often heard you ask us to add the ability to remove its slat screens, decreasing mass and improving its mobility. You got it! The corresponding module is now available in the Modifications menu. Well, looks like it's time to answer your questions from the comments now. The first question was sent by a player called KittyLove09. Does having your canopy taken off before you get to the sky and then flying around with no canopy do anything? Hi, Kitty Love. An open cockpit increases air drag and as a result, worsens the flight performance of your aircraft. Another question comes from Emilio Elas. How can I change the amount of smoke used in a smoke screen? My tank only shoots two smokes, Leopard 2A5. Hey, Emilio. We reduced the number of grenades used in each launch so that players could use them more sparsely. You can still press the key several times and create a thicker smoke screen if you want. We don't think it needs a separate setting. Pui Pui writes, How do I use a time fuse shell on tanks like the Flak 88? Hi there! All you need to do to set a time fuse is measure the distance with a rangefinder. And the last comment for today was written by Cool7Boy. What's the best attack airplane you have in the game? Hi, Cool Boy. Well, um, there's quite a number of questions we need to ask before we can answer you. Like, best in what kind of tasks? What battle rating? What mode? There is also the question of numerous classifications that don't always do a good job of defining attack airplanes. So, how about we ask our viewers instead? What's your favorite attack aircraft in War Thunder? That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to feed your MiG-29 every four hours, but never after midnight. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.